Celebrating 10 years, and there's a lot of good things going on this year with Rage Against Addiction. So I am sitting here with Wendy, the executive director, the founder of Rage Against Addiction. And we have something big coming up this year. The Memory Walk, was it the Memory Walk 5K? It's Memory Walk Recovery Run. It's Rage Against Addiction's Memory Walk Recovery Run 2024. Uh, This is our biggest fundraiser of the year. Uh, We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to provide awareness and support to anyone that struggles from drug and or alcohol abuse. And this event brings together um, a a large variety of people, um, those who have lost loved ones to the disease of addiction, and also we celebrate those in recovery. So this 5K is um, a run, and we have a lot of runners who are running um, to support recovery. We have runners that run in memory of a, a loved one that is no longer with us, and then we have a really large group of family members that come out, bring photos of their loved ones and just celebrate them and just try to bring some awareness to the disease. Uh, This supports our programs. We have sober living houses in Bel Air, Maryland for women. And we also have some other programs that support uh, new moms in recovery. Uh, We support uh, kids by being a resource broker. And we've done some funding throughout the years to help people get into sober living. So, so this is this is a big deal for us. This is the the event that brings a lot of awareness to the community. It brings awareness to all that we're doing. And like Rich said, it's our 10th anniversary. So we we really want to let you know that we're here to stay. And the reason that we're doing what we're doing so well is because of all of the support in the community. And so we we, we welcome you to to join us. You can also join us virtually through the entire month of April. April uh, 1st through the 30th, we have a virtual event. And then the 13th is our actual in-person event at Cedar Lane Regional Park in Bel Air. You can register through our website, which is www.rageagainstaddiction.org. You can find all your info there. Uh, it'll take you to run sign up. You can create a team. You can do some um, independent fundraising with your family in memory of your loved one. And we also welcome sponsors. Sponsors get a place on our website. Your logos will go there. We give a shout out at the event. We're going to have some speakers from our alumni which is really what's near and dear to my heart. And again, it's, you know, it brings us all together and, and we hope that you can be there. And now, and correct me if I'm wrong, the run is a 5K, but you can also walk it, which is what, one mile? We we have um, a route that goes around Cedar Lane uh, Regional Park. They have a, a path. And when you do the 5K, you, you do two laps. Our walkers okay. tend to do one. So it's like half, you know, it's probably like, okay. it's probably like a, a mile, a mile and a little. Yeah, I can do the walk. You don't have to be here to participate. And we encourage that because we know that no family is immune and addiction, unfortunately, isn't going away. And we have a new uh, up and coming generation that was plagued by COVID and we're seeing the youth population really struggle. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that they continue to have the resources that they need. So again, they go to rageagainstaddiction.org to sign up. Yes. Under events. Or to become a sponsor as well. Oh yes. Please, 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 please sponsor. On this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. One of the things that Bud said to me and I think this is crucially important no matter where we are in life and no matter, you know, whether I'm, whether I'm 18 or, and I'm just getting sober or whether I'm, you know, 58, which is how old I am now. And I'm, and I'm moving on with my life. But, but Bud said, first things first and the rest shall be added on. So, and what that means to me is, and how I've tried to conduct myself, and you know, things get a little more profound as you get older, and, and the understanding gets better as you get older. But, um, or at least that's the hope, right? Mm-hmm. But, but uh, you know, taking care of myself and taking care of my body and my mind and my heart and my soul as my first priority. Um, and, and if I do that, 
and and the great one of the great things about life is if I do that, I'm good for everyone else. I'm good for those around me. I'm good for my wife. I'm good for our sons. I'm good for my family. I'm good for the person walking down the street because if I feel good and I give them a smile and that's something that they needed that day at that time, I'm able to do that because I'm taking care of myself. If I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not able to do that. So so I feel like like first things first and the rest shall be shall be added on is something I carry with me every day and I can get off track and I can get, you know, nuts and I can be a maniac and all that sort of thing, but if I reel myself back in and take care of those things that make me better, I'm better for the rest of the world. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than me. Guys, we've been together. I got a plate on my arm. Oh man, you already said it. I was going to ask her. She remembered the thing. Thanks for joining the conversation where we explore the stories and experiences that shape our world. I'm your host, Rich Bennett, and today I am thrilled to welcome Daryl Dittmer, an author celebrated for his candid and transformative storytelling. Daryl's debut work, When I Stopped Fighting, The Unexpected Joy of Getting My Head Out of My Ass, invites readers on a compelling journey of self-discovery and personal growth. His writing not only captivates, but also offers profound insights into the power of embracing life's challenges. And we're going to hear about some of the challenges. So join us as Daryl shares his experiences and profound impact his book has had on its readers. How's it going, Daryl? It's going great. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. But look, I, I've got to kick things off by talking about your book's title because it's an eye catcher. What's the story behind it, and what does it mean for you personally? Well, I I knew the title of my book, but I wasn't sure of the subtitle. The title comes with a story as well, but mm-hmm. but the subtitle was difficult to nail. And and my wife and I actually went through several iterations in terms of thinking about it. And uh, and one day we were on an, an RV trip, and and it just sort of came to us. I think you know, maybe both at the same time, Um, because we wanted it to be eye-catching. We wanted it to be, um, you know, something that people gravitated toward or looked twice at, but but also, you know, we didn't want to be offensive to people that might be a little more sensitive. So, right. but But then that's probably the least of my worries if I'm writing a book about addiction and, you know, all of the uh, exciting, exciting happenings. So, for me, it was very real. For me, getting my head out of my ass was something that I needed to do. And uh, and once that came out of our mouths and minds, it it just stuck. I love the title. I do, man. I mean, it just, uh, it, it grabs you. It Thank grabs you. you. But it, 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 to me, it sounds like, I mean, it's about your journey, not just with addiction, but you've also owned businesses and all as well, right? Yes, Yes. So does definitely. it cover that as well? It does. It's, you know, it talks about it talks about coming from a place where, you know, my my dad was a mechanic, my mom took care of us kids, and and so right. coming from a place where uh, you know, it was I wouldn't say that was fairly humble beginnings, you know. So right. So there's a lot of shit to do, right? When you're when you're you get sober, like the the beginning is getting sober and then then you got to get your head out of your ass, you know? It's so and that's a lifelong process. I mean, I'm probably still working on it to a large extent, <laughs> you know? All right, so I got to ask you, how many, how long have you been sober now? Uh just hit 39 years. Really? That yeah. is awesome wait are you going to run for 39 hours <laughs> well i don't think i can do 39 push-ups anymore i probably can't even do 10 but uh but you know, my body's taking a little bit of a beat but um the, yeah running for 39 hours mm, no the the reason i say that we had a gentleman on who actually ran across the sahara desert and every year he for to celebrate his sobriety he'll run for that many hours. And this wow. year, 
Yeah. The, and he was, I believe, in the mountains of North Carolina. This year, he ran for 32 hours. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, as much as I'd love to, um, <laughs> my body's not doing that anymore. Yeah. I'll watch you run, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll, maybe I saw the guy. We're, we're pretty close to the North Carolina border, so maybe I saw him <laughs> running by one day. I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised. So you actually touch on the theme of fighting through, throughout your narrative. Can you dive a bit deeper into what that fight was against and what led you to eventually lay down your arms? Sure. Um, you know, the fight for me was or has always been with myself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the greatest fight. So, so you know, we start with with however we grow up. For me, going into addiction and, you know, having that uh, progressed to the point where, you know, treatment became the option. Um, you know, the, the first fight is setting down the, you know, the drugs and the booze and, and, you know, just sort of stopping that and, and making that, that go away. But, but we alluded to it a little bit earlier that, that after that, that's really when the work starts. Right. So there's a chapter in my book where I talk about the ass kicking machine and the ass kicking machine is basically me beating the hell out of myself for not being where I think I should be in life or, right. you know, thinking things that they tell me I'm not supposed to be thinking or doing things or feeling things and, and pushing those things away. Like, like that's, you know, for me, that's the real fight. That's yeah. where, um, you know, and it gets, it gets more and more subtle over time, but, but, the more, and I watch myself do this. Um, I'll, I'll just tell a little story of where that came from the, the, the fighting part. But when I was newly sober, it was probably nine months or maybe a year. Um, mm -hmm. I had a sponsor and his name was Bud. And, you know, he's a huge reason why I, uh, got my head out of my ass truly. Um, but, right. I was, I was wrestling with some problem or, or fighting some problem, you know, just having grown up that way to, to just fight things. And, and he said, Daryl, when you stop fighting, the fighting stops. And that's the reason for the, the oh. title of my book, not necessarily the subtitle, but the title. So, so it's really fighting myself. That's, that's been the, the most difficult uh, fight of my life. Wow. That, and you still talk with Bud? No, Bud passed away in 2016. Oh, sorry to hear that, man. Oh, God. thank you. So Wonderful. every journey has, we talked about this a little bit before uh, we started recording, but every journey has its watershed moments. You can break out the Kleenex and everything. Can you share one from your book that you think really resonates with your readers? Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a few it's, 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 you know, the moments for me that, that changed my life. There was, uh, there's a, there's a, for, a way for me to be in, in life and in sobriety and, um, in terms of, of how I behave and how I act and, and keep myself from fighting myself and keep myself from fighting the world and fighting problems and all that sort of thing. It, it, it's the easiest thing in the world for me to do, but, um, and being teachable, that's, that's mm -hmm. probably the most important thing for me. And, and, and early on, um, I heard an old timer and he, at that time he was about 40 years sober. And this is, this is, uh, one of the chapters in my book, or it's referred to in one of the chapters of my book, but he was about 40 years sober and I'm, you know, I'm months sober and his right. name is Jimmy. And he's, he's an older gentleman. He's probably definitely in his seventies. I wouldn't say quite eighties, but he's in his seventies. And, and, and we looked at him like he was a deity, you know, it, it's all of my young friends in sobriety and we're 19, 20 years old and we're just punks and we're clowns. And, you know, we want to stay sober. At least some of us want to stay sober and right. And uh, we go to this Friday night community center meeting and, and Jimmy's there and he's there every time we see him every time. And, and uh, you can just imagine this, you know, kind of an old guy and, and a little hunched over. And 
he gets up in the middle of every single meeting and he grabs the coffee pot and he's filling people's coffee um, cups with coffee. And he's the only guy that ever did that. And wow. one of the things, and, and it was such a powerful moment for me and my sobriety and my life from a humility perspective and, 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 you know, teachability perspective, just seeing something like that. Right. Um, Cause the way we used to look at sobriety and the way I used to look at sobriety was, you know, whoever's got the most time wins. And that's not necessarily true, you know, mm-hmm. cause, because sometimes, you know, people don't learn those lessons, but, but Jimmy used to say, and this is the part that really hit me and stuck with me, you know, almost every day for the last almost 40 years, he used to say, the way to stay sober is to stay small. The way so to stay a, sober is to stay small. Stay small. Stay humble. You know, service. Do things for other people. Yeah. Don't worry so much about yourself. Be teachable. Um, and that really started wow. me on the track of, for me, understanding how to be sober um, and how to conduct myself in sobriety so that I'm getting the most out of it. Wow. I like that. That, that, and I, maybe that is something that's missing where a lot of people aren't staying small. Maybe that's why, you know, a lot of people do relapse. You think? I I think that's, I think that's possible. I I really do. I think, you know, I, (laughs) I see it on social media and this goes into a whole different conversation, but, um, since we're here, you know, you see a lot of people that, that want to teach before they've been students, you know, be, and and I'm a big proponent of be a student first. Um, and, and that wasn't as much of a thing, you know, back in, uh, 1985, January of 85 is when I got sober and, and, you know, you came into a program like an AA or, you know, and, and basically it was, it was, listen, they, you know, here's what you need to do. You need to shut up and listen. That was, Mm -hmm. that was kind of how it went. But, you know, I see people all over the place on social media, et cetera, et cetera. Just, you know, okay, I've been sober for a month. Here's what everybody else needs to do. And, uh, that is, to me, that's the definition of not staying small and, and right. not being teachable. Well, not only that, everybody's different as well. You know, uh, it, it's some things work for some people, whereas it may not work for others. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things that always uh, amazed me when, when I started learning more and more uh, about the sobriety and recovery circle, I I should say family because it's like a tight knit family. Everybody's helping each other. Mm -hmm. I never heard of, I didn't have any idea what a peer recovery specialist was. And the first time I met peer recovery specialists and they told their stories, I was blown away. I didn't realize that they themselves were in recovery Mm -hmm. and it makes sense. Who else can help? somebody that's in recovery better than somebody that's in recovery that's living that experience you know 100%. It just, yeah it, it just blew me away <clears throat> that was Sorry. that was the founding of of aa i think it was mm-hmm. 1935 but that was the founding you know bill w and dr bob and they helped each other stay sober and and uh you know and and the program sprang from that you know, there was, I know there were other things involved, but, but that was the, that was what they did. They helped each other. They supported each other. And, and yeah. truly that's how I try to, to try to help people is through, you know, the, the stories, the stories of, because I feel like people can relate when you tell a story. If I'm, mm-hmm. if I'm telling somebody do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Um, I, I don't think, they care as much as if you're telling a story and they say, Oh, wow, that, you know, that's kind of like what happened to me or that's, you know, I can really they relate. Can relate to that. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that's incredibly important. Oh yeah, absolutely. Be, because, it, and now they're also meeting somebody else that's been through it, you know, and, and talking right. about, it. so if they see that you can do it, then hopefully they'll figure it that they can do it as well. Actually, when with your addiction, what was your main addiction? 
Was it alcohol? Anything I could afford at any given time. Mm, um, wow. I mean, it was, you know, it, it went from, from, you know, just some drinking to smoking weed to hallucinogens mm-hmm. to Coke to, you know, whatever I could get my hands on. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, I was a kid, I was, I had just turned 19 when I went into treatment. So I was, wow. Know, not like I had money, you know, it's not like I could afford much. So I was, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever I could do to, to, uh, get a couple of bucks and support, you know, me doing what I was trying to do every day. How old were you when you started? 13. Oh, Wow. So if you don't, if you can share that story about what brought that on at 13 years old, you know, it wasn't, it it was, it was probably a story very similar to many people's stories. You know, it was Mm -hmm. my buddy and I were, were, uh, at a little, uh, it was actually a church function. Um, I grew up, (laughs) yeah, I grew up, uh, in, you know, as a Lutheran, that was kind of how I was raised in yeah. the West. And, um, uh, we were at a little church function and, and we were drinking, I think it was rum and Coke. And it was the first time that I had anything outside of, you know, my parents, my dad giving me a sip of beer or something, right. or whatever. But, and, and I, I drank some of that and it was the most euphoric feeling I'd had to that point in my life. Um, wow. And, you know, probably other than going to the dentist and having a surgery in my mouth and them giving me some happy drugs. And that was <laughs> maybe the first one before that. That was the happiest moment of my life. So wow. it, it was just something that that hit me in such a way. It was it was it was literally euphoric. It was that's that's what I wanted to do um, after that. That was it was really that powerful um, right at the beginning. Wow. Holy cow, 13. And then you, you, you became your sobriety. You said started in 19 or is that when you went into treatment for the first time or did no, or I that, went was that the first and only first and only? Yeah. January okay, 3rd, 1985. Yeah. That, that was when I went to treatment. Um, and, uh, and that was the only time I went to treatment and, and you know, that, that, what I got out of, I, I didn't plan on staying sober. I bought a, I bought a bunch of weed, uh, right before I went in and, you wow. know, I like, okay, let's, well, let's get this over with and, and go from there. But I ended up, I ended up selling it when I got out, um, recouping the expenditure cause I needed, you know, that <laughs> yeah. was, money was hard to come by, but the only frame of reference I had of anybody going to treatment was one of my buddies went into a longer term treatment program. And before I went and he came out and within 10 minutes, he was out partying with us, you know, sitting oh. in, sitting in this buddy's house, watching MTV closet classics and doing our drugs. Good Lord, man. Flashback. <laughs> yeah. Right. MTV closet. closet. <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, that's when um, MTV used to play music, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I remember the you know Bob Marley and the Whalers, the Closet Classics. That was uh, oh god, yeah. I still remember when it first launched. I remember watching Video Killed the Radio Star. <laughs> that, uh, it, oh yeah, man. When that when MTV launched, it was a big. I forget what month, but it was what 1981, right? Yeah, I somewhere mean, in yeah. that ballpark. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. then, and then what the hell happened to him? Yeah, jeez. So, so when you went when you went into treatment, were you working at the time? Oh yeah. Um, okay. Actually, at at that time, I was I had a job at a gas station. Um, I was behind the counter, and and uh, well, that's another story from my book. But just you know, this <laughs> I, I, I was was in kind of a, a little crappy part of town and uh you know just the the thugs and the punks and everybody would just come filing through and i'd be it was an all night all you know 24 hour oh, place yeah. i'd work there at night and uh you know we'd and i'd get high with the customers and and uh, it was just that that was you know i i didn't really have um gainful employment that's right you know, working at the gas station that's all i was doing all right so when you go into treatment and you start your journey of sobriety. 
as far as your career path goes, how did that change? Well, when I was um, in high school, I, I had a, I did pretty well in basketball. I was one of those guys who liked, I, I loved sports, mm -hmm. um, but then I went down the, you know, the other path too. So, you know, the jocks and the stoners, I was kind of riding the edge. I was more of a stoner, but I played basketball. And so I, I got a letter from actually University of Wisconsin, Stout, which I think is D2, and they wanted me to play for them. And I was told by this woman in, in high school, she said, oh, I just got a letter from these guys. And I kind of looked at it. I was like, ah, whatever. You know, I just wasn't interested. So wow. I don't come from a college educated <clears throat> family. Uh, so college was something where it was sort of out there somewhere. It wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily a realistic thing. So um. I, to make a long story short, I decided after I got out of treatment that I wanted to go to college. I didn't get in touch with the University of Wisconsin, but I did get in touch with a local uh, Division three school around me, mm -hmm. um, about 50 miles away from where I grew up. And uh, so I ended up going there, uh, you know, severe academic probation, all kinds of great stuff that I think the basketball coach help get me in. But so from a career perspective, um, I, I, I got a criminal justice degree because that's all I knew at that point. My, wow. My, yeah. Well, I didn't know anything about business or marketing or sales or you know, right. nothing. Um, so my frame of reference was my dad was a mechanic. Um, my brother was a cop. My grandfather on my mom's side was a cop. My grandfather on my father's side was a firefighter. So so I thought, okay, criminal justice, I can, I can get my head around that. Um, but that's not the path I chose. I got out of college right. and I, uh, I did, I did framing for a while. I did carpentry. Carpentry, but eventually didn't you also become a business owner? I did. How'd that <laughs> happen? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so when I was doing carpentry, a buddy of mine, uh, actually a sober friend of mine, got uh, asked me if I wanted to get involved in sales. And I said, no, absolutely not. Not doing it. No, thanks. No, <laughs> nothing about that stuff. It just doesn't sound that fun. I'm not a I'm not a public facing guy. Um, right. That's not how I portrayed it back then. But it was just basically no. Uh, so anyway, he, he gave me this videotape and it was for a network marketing company. and. Uh, and I didn't know anything about it. I was just like, he's like, oh, the people are making tons of money. So it took me a few weeks to watch the video. I watched it and I was like, holy crap, people are actually making this kind of money without, you know, pounding nails and lifting walls and, and uh, you know, doing all this crazy stuff. So, mm -hmm. so I got involved in it and I started it. And then, um, you know, it went okay for probably a year. And then uh, another buddy of mine said, oh, hey, you know, we got this sales thing we're doing you want to go to Boston with us? And I was like, sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so I took off and went to Boston. And, uh, and that was a, that was, we were doing smoking cessation, stress management and weight control for corporations. Um, and that's a mouthful <laughs> municipalities, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we our, the joke was, well, people in Boston are too stressed to do anything about their stress. And, um, no offense to anybody from Boston, but, uh, um, you know, that was just kind of the thing. So everybody went back to the Detroit area. I decided to stay and, uh, cause I, it was just a new adventure for me. I was, right. I was excited about it. Um, so I did some carpentry to, you know, and I did some, um, uh, estimation for a commercial window company, you know, just a bunch of things just to keep myself going. And then I met a guy at the gym who owned a uh, commercial insurance brokerage and risk management firm. And I asked him for a job. And after much deliberation, he he gave me a job. But he but I had a job at thirty thousand dollars on a draw, which meant if I didn't make the money in sales to make that money back, I owed him thirty thousand uh dollars. -huh. So anyway, I took that and and. um I became, long story short, I became uh, the second largest shareholder in the company. And that company, through a couple different iterations, went from, uh, you know, 
seven employees to, I think now there's like 3,000. Whoa. Wow. Nice. So, yeah, that was that was part of it. And then I got ne- sick of that and uh, <laughs> the whole insurance business. And I did that for 20 some years. And, and then my wife and I bought a restaurant uh, down on Cape Cod and I've owned, you know, a few other interests in other businesses and that sort of thing. So looking for a construction company you can trust. <laughs> Let me share my incredible experience with Tar Hill Construction Group. When I needed to replace my roof, they truly transformed my home. From the start, their team displayed professionalism, expertise, and a commitment to excellence. They listened to my needs and provided a comprehensive plan of action. Their attention to detail was exceptional. Every shingle was installed with precision by their skilled professionals. I was amazed by their craftsmanship and the quality of materials they used and their cleanup. But what impressed me the most was their dedication to customer satisfaction. They communicated with me every step of the way, addressing my concerns promptly. Tar Hill Construction Group certification set them apart. Their JAF Master Elite Certified and GAF Master Select, held by only 2% of contractors in America. With them, I received top-notch installation, superior protection, and unmatched warranty options. Now I have a beautiful, durable roof I can rely on. Tar Hill Construction Group not only transformed my home's exterior, but also provided peace of mind and confidence in their work. If you're considering a roof replacement, siding, gutters, or solar, trust Tar Hill Construction Group. Visit TarHillConstructionGroup.com or call them at 410-638-7021. Experience the difference for yourself. Wait a minute. No. How how can that be? That that can't be because, you know, somebody that had an addiction can't do all that. Somebody that didn't um, basically get a, that degree in college can't do that. What do you say to those people that say stuff like that? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I don't want to say it. It. I want everybody to do well. I, yeah. I, you know, I just do. I think there's enough money in this world for everybody. I think there's enough opportunity in this world for everybody. I think, you know, it, 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 um, it bums me out when people talk like that because, yeah. because I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't have any skills. I didn't have any abilities. I didn't, you know, I wasn't a sales guy. I was, uh, I was, you know, I was a farm boy. Mm-hmm. I was a carpenter. Um, but, I just kept going. So what I, what I say to people is you got to reach, you know, you have to do things that you're not comfortable doing. Um, yes. I mean, honestly, I'm this whole podcast thing and social media and all that sort of stuff is, <laughs> that's not my, it's not my thing, but, but you know, I, I have to put myself out there. If I want to, if I want to get the message out and I want yeah. to honestly get books in people's hands and, and I'm I'm doing it because I want to help people. You know, I I want people to read it. I want people to get something out of it. I want people to be able to relate to it. So, so whatever you can't do right now or think you can't do, is a lie. It's just not true. Um, get your head out of your ass. You can do it. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> and and it doesn't even have to come all the way out. You know, you can do incrementally. You know, there mm-hmm. are things you can do incrementally. You move yourself forward. You know, I didn't, I didn't start being a, a good sales guy. I sucked, you know, and, and, and I got my ass handed to me a thousand times in business and in life and in everything. Um, so it, it really is a matter of, okay, what am I going to stretch for next? And, mm-hmm. and that's what, that's what, to me, that's what helped me move forward. And that's what helps other people move forward. You got to yeah. stretch. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the, 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 the saying is true. Sometimes you got to fail to succeed, you know, 100%. and, and you learn from them, learn from them. And, and now here you are. And I love this term. Now you're an authorpreneur. 
Yeah, I guess I am. I, I don't know if I've been called that <laughs> to this point in my life, but here I am. Yeah. Well, and it's something I tell authors because unfortunately there are a lot of authors that, you know, they'll write a book and it, it could be an awesome book, but they, they, they don't think about making money from it. It's like, why not? It, and you have a great message, you know, to get pass on to people. So this book, I could actually, with your book, yeah, I want your view on this. Who do you think your book is for? Besides yourself, of course. I mean, what what reader do you think the type of reader should we get? I think my reader uh, could be a couple of different folks. It could be mm-hmm. young people who are confused, who uh, are stagnated, who just aren't moving forward, whether it's there's a lot of addictions. There's a lot of things in this world to, to be addicted to, or to be, you know, I'll just say emotionally, maybe harmed from, or mentally harmed from it. It could be, it could be too much social media. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be, you know, gambling. It could be a number of things. So, so, you know, I think it's for people who want to change, but they don't know how, and they're Mm -hmm. younger and they, they want to be able to relate to someone who did change. Um, like I said earlier, I don't know if my head's all the way out of my ass, but it's, it's moved in the right direction for a few years. Um, and then I also think there's people like me, um, you know, uh, my age ish, uh, you know, maybe midlife, maybe they're again, you know, age doesn't necessarily mean, we're not confused or we're not struggling or we're not mm-hmm. sure what to do next. And I think, you know, it's difficult. I, I, I've my, my, both my wife and I have had to figure out, okay, you know, we're going to get out of this business and we're going to move into this business and we don't have a clue, or we're going to move out of this business. And we're going to move from Massachusetts down to Georgia because that's what we feel like doing right now, you know? Right. Um, so and some people don't want to do that. They don't want to take that risk or that leap. And I think this book is to, to, you know, for those people who may have some trepidation, but they want to, and they just need that little push. And I think it's in there. And and this was released in September, right? It was, it was kind of a, it's, it's sort of a six week (laughs) pre-launch cycle. So November 7th was the day that of the real launch, November 7th, 23. Um, And uh, so that's, that's kind of the date that it made it out to the public, I guess. Now, are you self-published or did you go through a publisher? Self-published. I got some help from, uh, from a company that, that, is I thought really good at, at helping because I didn't have a clue. And I think most, most authors don't, um, right. The book was written and I just needed to get it on Amazon or wherever else. So they help with the cover, they help with the editing, they help with the formatting, um, all that sort of stuff. They made it a much easier process than it would have been have, had I had to hunt all those things down. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Now, now, now the hard part comes, which is just the marketing. Yeah. And right. Thank God you're doing something that I tell all authors to do. And you're going on several different podcasts talking about it, which is, you know, that, that and social media seems to help out a lot. I think so. I, you know, I spend some time on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I try not, or I, I've not been a big social media guy, but it's interesting mm-hmm. It's interesting the communities that are out there on social media um, yeah. of, of like-minded humans, and and it's a pretty cool thing. I mean, you know, I do some Twitter spaces and talk about sobriety and talk about you know life, and, and I I at this point I equate life and sobriety as the same thing because uh, if you don't have sobriety, you don't have life, mm-hmm. um, and you know I I, I actually I have someone helping me with the marketing now. So, you know, doing little ads and things like that. And Oh, and good. Yeah. So it's, I'm trying to do as, as, you know, well-rounded of an approach as I can. Um, and we've sold a lot of books, but you know, a lot to me is like a few hundred. I, you know, if I want to, yeah. if I want something to get out there and help people, I want it to be 
tens of thousands or more, you know, just to to get the message out. Now, you're going through Podmatch, which I think is a something awesome that Alex put together. But I'm also going to tell you another place to check out. It's called newbooksnetwork.com. Sorry, Alex, it's not like pod match, but it's called <laughs> newbooksnetwork.com. It's a gentleman named Marshall Poe that runs it. There's several, several different podcasts on that. Check out, check them out and look for your genre. And what you do is listen to that podcast and pitch the host of that podcast, sort of like you did, you know, with me with through pod match, pitch the host of that podcast. Um, and, hopefully they'll get you on as well. There's, I, I forget how many, I, there's like millions of downloads from all the podcasts on there. Uh, but oh, it's, wow. a, yeah, it's called new. It's for all types of authors and it's called new books, network.com. Definitely check that out. Now, uh, have you gone to any libraries or anything? Um, any book sightings or even just going out, presenting your book, reading from it or whatever, anything like that yet? I have not done that yet. Um, and thank you for that website and that lead, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah, I my pleasure. I will, I will hunt that down with all the fervor at my disposal. Um, but I, I, I'm in one bookstore uh, on Cape Cod because we did a little trip there and I brought a book in and said, hey, you guys want to put my book on the shelf? Um, mm-hmm. So we did that. But other than that, no, I haven't done any book signings or libraries or book readings or or anything like that. I'm, I'm planning on uh, doing a little podcast myself, you know, nice. to, do those, to do those kinds of things. Um, so... And, and with the help of my marketing person, I think, you know, we'll be able to get that word out hopefully pretty well. I, I think also too, would y'all maybe look into some treatment centers, ask them For if sure. you can, yeah, come there and, and talk and present your book um, without a doubt, because you're seeing those books more and more. You're, you're here. Well, we talked about it earlier. A lot more people are coming out talking about it. And the more that, you know, you get your book out there. The more you tell your story, you're just helping more and more people, you know, which is a big plus. You got to do that. Now, 100%. Are, are you working on a second book yet? I am. Get out of here. Come on. Really? Yeah. It's actually written. It was. Uh, damn. So it, <laughs> I'm a little bit of a maniac. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, when I, when I decided in earnest to write the first book, uh, which was February ish, uh, 2023 by, uh, I'm going to say July, 2023, I had two books written. Um, Damn. and, uh, so the, yeah, the, the second one's written, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, it's edited. So that part's done. I've, I've got to get it formatted and finish up the cover, but, um, probably third quarter of this year, we'll put it out. Okay. Are you retired? Mostly. Okay. I was going to say, when are you finding the time to write that fast? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, two uh, books in not even a year's time. <laughs> Sometimes I, I come up into the office here, you know, with my robe on at four o'clock in the morning and mm. I'll just bang away at the keys for, you know, four or five, six hours and uh, just let it all flow. And uh, whatever ends up on the paper ends up on the paper. And then I figure it out after that. So um, I, I have a propensity to dive into things um, with <laughs> with intestinal fortitude and uh <laughs> I guess that's not what they would call it back in the addicted days, but, um, but that's what it's called today. It's, it's, I, I try to jump on things and take advantage of them. Like I say, you're an authorpreneur. It, it has become a full-time job. And I love that. The fact that you just get up and you start writing. And I'm sure when you, when you're going to town, you probably lose all track of time. Oh, I do. Right? Yeah. Now, because the, like you said, the flow's going, man. It's, I, I love that. I wish I could get my ass. I got to get my head out of my ass and do that. <laughs> well, I think the, uh, the cool part to me is, um, 
you know, once it starts flowing, I remember shit that I haven't thought about in 30 years or mm -hmm. 40 years or, or 50 years, you know, it's, it's amazing what comes up, you know, people have asked me or, or comment, you know, what's the most, what's the best part of writing. Um, and the best part of writing is, is unearthing all the stuff that you thought might have been gone or that you hadn't thought about and it just comes bubbling up and uh and to me that's the way to write just sit and go and, right. and don't stop until you're worn out so i i have to ask you this question i i, I love it when um uh, authors give tips so any aspiring author out there or even if they have never even thought about writing because one of the things i know uh when it comes to you know like anxiety or, or depression they tell you to journal i think in recovery a lot of them are starting to do that as well um but if some let's say somebody in that's in recovery and they're journaling and then they decide they want to write a book what bit of advice would you give them My probably the biggest piece of advice I would give them is because when I oh, I'll do a little cliffhanger there. Um, when I when I 18 years ago, I said to my wife, remind me to write a book someday. And I didn't write one until 2023. So, you know, I fiddled around. I'd write a paragraph or a half a page or whatever. Um, and, and it didn't get me anywhere. So, so the best advice I could give to somebody who's thinking about it or, you know, they enjoy writing and they just want to do it is you just got to sit down and devote time and do it. If you don't do that, the book will never get written. And, right. and, and you'll never have that flood in my opinion of the memories and all the things that bubble up because you're writing, because those things don't bubble up until you tell the first story. And then the mm -hmm. second story comes up and then like, oh, crap, there's the third story, you know, so so it doesn't bubble up until, you know, you get something on paper. So with this being your first book, when you finished it and you can't answer yourself, who was the first one to read your book? Was it your wife? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what did she say? Uh, the first time <laughs> she said, you finally got your head out of your ass and writ wrote this book. <laughs> well, that that's almost every day. But um, as far as far as the book thing, um, I, it was something along the lines of, you know, I knew a lot of these stories, but I had no idea how insane and profound every you know the impact was on you mm -hmm. um so that was yeah that was that was uh that was a really cool moment i think for both of us because you know after at that point after almost 20 years of marriage um you know she got to know me a little better and know a little more about how i tick and i also got to know a little bit more about how she ticks which was which was a really cool unintended consequence of of uh the first book now she's gonna have to write a book right yeah <laughs> she could um and and she'd probably be better at it than me <laughs> um she's she's much more organized and much more uh you know she takes care of all the the smart stuff and i just you know i just plot around and and <laughs> do what i do so <laughs> <laughs> so, so, something very important tell everybody your website and where they can find your book uh sure my website is www.daryldittmer.com which is d-a-r-y-l-d-i-t-t-m-e-r.com and for those of you listening when you get it don't forget the title first of all when i stop fighting the unexpected joy of getting my head out of my ass. You can get it on Kindle, hardcover, or paperback. Actually, uh, any plans on doing an audio audio version? In my spare time, um, I'm on chapter. I'm through chapter five, uh, and oh. I will. Yeah, I will have an audio because I'm doing it in my voice, and I just had Good. to learn how to do that. So, 
Um, I'm narrating it. It should be out. I'm going to say probably April or May of 2020. Nice. Nice. So when you guys get it, make sure you leave a full review, whether it be on Amazon, good pods or whatever. Um, because we want, we want to see Daryl's book climb back up those charts again. Got to get it back up to number one and keep it there for a while. Like Pink Floyd's, what was it? Dark side of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that. <laughs> God, I was drawn up. Oh, you know what? Man, here's the DJ. I'm getting ready to say Pink Floyd's thriller. It's like, no, that, <laughs> that was Michael Jackson. <laughs> So where is my uh, mind at? Holy cow. So before I get to my last question, is there anything you would like to add? You know, I, I, I believe that it's, you know, life is a journey that, that to me needs to be explored and taken advantage of and relentlessly pursued. Um, and that's what I love to see people do. And I, I love to see people take advantage of everything that life can offer. Um, and if my book helps them do that, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. And, and, uh, Rich, I thank you so much for, for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, man. Um, so you've been doing the podcast circuit now. Is there anything a host has never asked you or myself that, you wish they would have asked you. And if so, what would be that question and what would be your answer? Uh, you know, I haven't thought about this before, but um, I guess what would be the, the most life-changing lesson that you learned in recovery? Because I hadn't got Ooh. specifically that question, um, and and I'm ready to answer it. What what would be your answer for that? So the um, the answer is Bud, who was my sponsor, and mm -hmm. you know I, I was flailing at the time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's generally, I think it's probably, a, a for me, it was about a five year window that I was just very unsure, very, uh, insecure, very, uh, just didn't know what to do. Didn't know exactly how to act that sort of thing. Um, and it took me that amount of time, I think, to just feel like I'm on a track. Um, so, but one of the things that Bud said to me and I think this is crucially important no matter where we are in life and no matter, you know, whether I'm, whether I'm 18 or, and I'm just getting sober or whether I'm, you know, 58, which is how old I am now. And I'm, and I'm moving on with my life. But, but Bud said, first things first and the rest shall be added on. So, and what that means to me is, and how I've tried to conduct myself and, you know, things get a little more profound as you get older and, and the understanding gets better as you get older, but, um, or at least that's the hope, right? Mm -hmm. But, but uh, you know, taking care of myself and taking care of my body and my mind and my heart and my soul as my first priority um, and, and if I do that and, and the great, one of the great things about life is if I do that, I'm good for everyone else. I'm good for those around me. I'm good for my wife. I'm good for our sons. I'm good for my family. I'm good for the person walking down the street, because if I feel good and I give them a smile and that's something that they needed that day at that time. I'm able to do that because I'm taking care of myself. If I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not able to do that. So, so I feel like, like first things first and the rest shall be, shall be added on is something I carry with me every day and I can get off track and I can get, you know, nuts and I can be a maniac and all that sort of thing. But if I reel myself back in and take care of those things that make me better, I'm better for the rest of the world. I love that. Man, I that is that is awesome. That's uh that was probably one of the best questions and answers at the for the end of one of my episodes. Seriously, that was I want to get that thank you. I want to get that etched into a board and put on a just 
hang it on my wall. Mm. I, I love that. I, I think that's something good that everybody should follow. Wow. Daryl, I want to thank you so much. It, it's been a true pleasure. And you know you got to come back on when the second book is getting released, right? Would love that. Oh, that would be so cool. I, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Oh, definitely. The door is open. And if if you have any questions or need any help with the launch of your podcast, just give me a holler. I've been doing this since 2015, so I, I got a little bit under my wings. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will. I definitely will. You know, maybe I'll send you a little clip and say, how bad does this suck? And you can, you can tell me, you know, how I did. Um, yeah, yeah, hey, very cool. I, I'd love it, that. It's, it's fun. You'll have a blast and you'll, you'll learn a lot from it. I, my biggest bit of advice when it comes to podcasts and, and anybody wants to get, get into the podcast, remember this, never, ever delete an episode even if it's your first episode never delete it because i still go back to those first episodes i listen to them i'm like wow that was really awful but (laughs) as far as the sound goes and everything else but the message was still getting across and that's the thing you never want to get rid of the message so that, that's Very the main cool. thing to remember when you get when you know when you start that. Daryl, Daryl, thanks a lot, man. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate it, man. Very, very much. We'll be talking. I'll uh Sounds I'll be good. reaching out. Thank you. I want to thank my guests for coming on this episode, but I really want to thank you for listening. And I would really appreciate it if you left a review about the show or about this episode. And you can actually do that right from the website. Go to conversationswithrichbennett.com. You can leave a comment about this episode. You can leave a review for the podcast in general. Another thing I would love for you to do, of course, follow us on social media. But send me a voicemail. If there is somebody you want me to get on the show, if you want to come on the show, if there is something you would like for us to discuss, send a voicemail or send an email. If you send a voicemail, if you want, I can actually play it back on the show, too. So, Just saying. Uh, But no, seriously, I want to thank you for listening because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't be as successful as it is. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much.